Hey everyone, welcome to My Wife the Dietitian, a weekly podcast about lifestyle and healthy eating. I'm Rob, and together with my wife, Sandra, we invite you to join us on this informative yet entertaining journey through the complex world of healthy eating. We'll cover everything but the kitchen sink. Each week, we'll discuss topics ranging from how to protect yourself from developing cancer, spicy foods to rev up the libido, to caring for your palliative grandfather with Alzheimer's. We'll also delve into more complex issues like, what the heck is oat milk? Why doesn't my butt fit into these jeans? And every guy's favorite question, will eating spinach really make it bigger? Join us each week as we strive to educate, enlighten, and entertain you. There's been some pretty wacky diet trends out there over the years. The cigarette diet, the cabbage soup diet, the mastication diet. Uh, I said mastication? Yeah. Some pretty interesting stuff. On today's show, we're going to delve into the history of dieting and get this skinny on diet trends through the years. Find out what works, what doesn't, and which ones are best suited for a comedy routine. Join us as we take you through an entertaining look at the history of dieting. Hi, Rob. Hey, Sandra. Did you know that March is Nutrition Month? I did not know that. Well, because it is, we're going to look at the fad diets and uh, nutrition trends through the years, through the generations. Oh, I I can imagine they've gone back a ways. Well, yeah. I mean, there's one thing that uh, never gets old is um, always changing diet fads. Yeah, it seems like it, hey? <laughs> so, yeah, this, this should be interesting. Yeah, there's always something, eh? Always. Yeah, so it's interesting, actually, starting from like 1830, there was uh, tapeworm eggs that uh, people ate so that they could uh, lose weight. Are you serious? Yeah, seriously. Way back then, hey? Yeah, yeah it's been happening for, yeah. So they could fit the in those crazy dresses that they used to wear. Yeah, it was downright dangerous. I would say so. Because you can't control where those tapeworms go and they would clog pancreatic ducts or the bile ducts and yeah, it could be pretty serious. That is downright dangerous. Is that interesting? Uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of creepy actually. And at the turn of the century in 1900, there was something called the mastication diet. Well, there's, the, the, there's something that needs a bit of work on the marketing, I think. <laughs> I don't think that one would fly these days. (laughs) Well, it was promoted or uh, originated by a person named Horace Fletcher, and he was the great masticator. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) Yep. Horace, you go. (laughs) And he said... What you doing there, Horace? (laughs) I'm just masticating. (laughs) It was... uh, (laughs) You had to chew, chew, chew your food so thoroughly that it became liquid until... um, you couldn't swallow until it was liquid. So it's actually, it, in a way, it's like the opposite of, you know, the hot dog eating contest and uh, people like eating really fast. Yes, I guess that would be the opposite <laughs> of the hot dog eating contest. That's a funny comparison. Well, it's but, a, No, I get it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. You're not just jamming it in as fast as you can. You got to like chew every bite until it's yeah, liquefied Ugh. until it's masticated. Yeah, yeah. And I remember there was some people used to say, oh, I have to count to 100, or 100 chews before I swallow. So I guess that was probably stemmed from the mastication diet. Well, you're supposed to chew your food anyway, right? Like you're not supposed to be swallowing big chunks of food. You're supposed to like kind of chew it up anyway, aren't you? Yeah, but to the point of being um, yeah, liquid, like that's a little bit uh, ex- extreme. extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, well, that's thanks. <laughs> thanks anyway, Horace. Nineteen <laughs> twenties was Back the cigarette diet. The cigarette diet. Yeah. You smoke instead of eat. Yep, exactly. That's still around, isn't it? It is. is it, like but people want to lose weight, they smoke, or they don't want to gain weight, so they don't quit smoking. That's yeah, part of it for sure. Yeah. So you know, Lucky Strike was uh, the company that uh, promoted smoking instead of eating, and it <laughs> suppresses the appetite and uh, unfortunately increases risk of lung cancer and other diseases. So no doubt. 
We know what a, a, what a funny campaign. <laughs> smoke. I'd love to see the commercials for that. That'd be interesting. Oh, you can look them up. There's smoke s- instead of eat. Yeah, the cigarette diet. Weird. And then soon after that was the grapefruit diet. Hmm. So, a.k.a. the Hollywood diet. Ah, uh, the Hollywood diet. And they say it helped burn fat to have grapefruit uh, with each meal. And caution for those that uh, are on certain medications because grapefruit has an interaction with cholesterol lowering medication, blood pressure medication. There's a lot of interactions with grapefruit and medication. So that's nowadays. Nowadays. Well, yeah. You're warning people nowadays, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I want to mention actually, before we go further, um, the features of a fad diet. Yeah. Good idea. So something that to help you evaluate with a critical eye, a certain diet that comes along, they usually have a promise of a quick fix to lose weight quickly. Um, They have rigid rules. They exclude or severely restrict certain nutrients or whole food groups. Um, They're touted to alter your body chemistry. And they usually talk about food as magic foods and food combinations. Yeah, I heard one on the just on YouTube today, it was a commercial and they're like, lose two pounds overnight by adding this one thing to your water. But then you had to like, you had to keep listening and then you probably had to like sign up for something or eventually you're going to have to give them money in order to find out what that magic food is That's yeah. and all the promises and there's always going to be money a- attached to it. That's right. That's right. The commercialism and, and fad diets are definitely have always been linked with marketing. So it's a popular culture. It's uh, that beauty myth that's it's like the whole weight loss unattainable because the ideals are always changing Mm -hmm. like you think of um you know marilyn monroe and she was like what a size 13 or something and then like the body image uh, body and um, she was sexy at the time yeah yeah what's considered yeah like um attractive or or sexy i guess yeah yeah and then twiggy and you think that's the opposite almost like that's like almost like the she you was know. like a super skinny model, right? In the what, eighties or something? No, I think uh, earlier than that. Oh like yeah, seventies or, or something. something. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it just um, it's good to be aware of uh, the marketing aspect and the commercialization. So usually, most diet programs are trying to sell you something or get you to sign up for something so that you spend your money and buy whatever they're promoting yeah they've they've done tons and tons of research and spelled spent tons of money figuring out what a demographic you fit into and how to market a product to you specifically yeah so exactly. that's why they're so good at it it's amazing yeah and then yeah with google analytics and everything i mean it really uh nowadays it's very pinpointed to target audience yeah yeah so just beware yeah that's interesting um so 1950s the cabbage soup diet cabbage soup well that doesn't sound i mean that sounds like at least it's it's healthy food it's not like cigarettes or yeah but the cabbage soup it was like pretty extreme it was like a starvation type diet or it's a, like a cleanse actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, cause you basically just ate cabbage soup for seven days. So it's you you're lacking a lot of vitamins, minerals, protein. Um, they said that you're going to w- lose 10 to 17 pounds. Um, well, yeah. Cause you're just, you're not probably getting enough food. Exactly. Yeah. Just wow. And I, w- I wonder how many people actually did that and were loving <laughs> love and life. Cause I can't imagine eating anything just one type of thing all the time seven days a week that would drive me crazy oh i know yeah it's like prison so some of the other uh names for the cabbage soup diet uh were dolly parton diet Mm. military cabbage soup diet mayo clinic diet sacred heart hospital diet uh spokane diet fat burning diet the skinny uh miracle soup diet and stewardess diet twa stewardess diet so interesting wow that's pretty funny and kind of not funny when you look at it um who it's who it's uh directed at yeah that was like 1950s yeah kind of a sad state of our of our society but uh expecting expecting women to look a certain way and and here eat this and you can look like a twa stewardess or whatever that's true. Their, yeah. Know, or, yeah. Or the Dolly Parton diet. Yeah. It's like, oh, really? Cabbage makes that happen? <laughs> That's funny. 
So then uh, 1970s, the Atkins diet was started. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that one. Yeah. That was Robert Atkins with the the goal of to change your metabolism. And he believed that carbohydrates, not fat, were responsible for health problems. So it was a higher fat, higher protein, low carb type diet. That sounds familiar. Mm-hmm. And the um, Scarsdale, it's similar. Uh, it was um, higher protein and banned snacks. So that was uh, all related. And then the Atkins. Atkins has been um, edited and revised over and over again, and we'll talk more about that when we get back into the uh, 2000s. Okay. 1980s, the Beverly Hills diet, and that was uh, uh, related to the food combining, so you don't eat carbs with protein at the same time. And because um, people were following that, they ended up eating smaller amounts of food, and so they lost weight. Sounds interesting, but kind of wouldn't work for me. I well, like just putting everything in a pot. and. <laughs> well, and it's not sustainable, really, you yeah. know, to always... I don't well, know. how do you eat a pizza? Exactly. It's all, how do you eat spaghetti and meatballs? Or I know. Yeah. It's, yeah, it really makes you, like, kind of analyze everything, right, when yeah, you're totally. on a diet. It's like, oh, can I have that? And can I have that? And um, in 1963, the Weight Watchers uh, was started, and it's got a following of 1.1 million members now. Well, that makes sense. I mean, that's probably the one that everybody recognizes, and it's been around forever. And yeah, yeah, it got so popular that even restaurants would put were putting the points on their menu items. So because yeah. Weight Watchers has a point system and then the weigh-ins, so like the support groups and weigh-ins. Right, right. And that has been proven. Um, re- research has shown that to help with weight loss over time and for sustainability, having you know, regular monitoring, like someone, a support group atmosphere or someone to monitor over time and uh, just so that you're not doing it alone. Yeah, that makes sense. A support network. Yeah. And actually in the 80s, all the diet centers, that was when uh, like diet centers came around, like frozen meals and Jenny Craig and Nutrisystem and they had the support and coaching. Right. I guess they sort of have that nowadays, but it's all online versions of them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Noom. Yeah. 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 So around uh, when the diet centers and frozen meals came into popularity, then also nutrient rich meal replacements like shakes and drinks and supplements um, came became popular. And that was in the 80s, um, like Slim Fast and Optifast. Nowadays, I mean, we still have things like that, like the Isogenics or other drink type things to help, you know, with your weight loss goals. Yeah. I, I was got a kick out of those shakes when they came out. I think I was a kid when they when they first came out and I thought, you know, like they're supposed to be like for weight loss, but they're designed to be like a milkshake which is like, you know, like a treat back in the day, you know, your McDonald's milkshake, but that's true. That's, that's, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of ironic that it's, it's for weight loss, but they make it taste like, well, I guess that's why they make it taste like that, but they're like, yeah, it's just kind of funny. Yeah. Like actually the, um, the liquid diet, like 1988, which is kind of what we're talking about, like Optifast was made popular with, uh, I think Oprah Winfrey. She, uh, came out wearing a pair of size 10 jeans and then had like pulling a wagon filled with 67 pounds of fat to show how much weight she lost on the Optifast. I remember that. Do you remember that? Yeah. I used to to watch Oprah. (laughs) I think everyone did. Oh yeah. Four (laughs) o'clock school after school. That's right. Sorry, I can't play today. I got to go watch Oprah. (laughs) I learned a lot. Oh, and then uh, she, I guess she had written on her website that when she started Optifast in July 1988, she was at 212 pounds. By fall, she weighed 145 pounds. And what she didn't know, she said, was that her metabolism was shot. Two weeks after I returned to real food, I was up 10 pounds. Since I wasn't exercising, there was nothing my body could do but regain the weight. Right. So that's actually encapsulates like the whole issue with diets and the yo-yo dieting and the impact of like you know being on a restrictive eating plan and it's not real life and then you kind of like 
you, it's not sustainable because you feel like I can I you know can't keep doing this forever I, I feel like I can't go out with my friends or I can't go to potlucks or I can't join in the social occasions because I'm on this certain diet and then you kind of get off the diet or you've reached your goals and then you start to eat regular food again and what happens yeah and the weight comes back yeah i think part of a part of a good diet would be more focused on not so much losing weight but on changing your lifestyle so that once you achieve your goals you can just carry on because your lifestyle like you've changed your lifestyle along the way yeah absolutely i agree with that especially just like making those uh, small behavior changes that you know that are uh, probably pitfalls to your healthy lifestyle Mm mm-hmm yeah so yeah definitely um like mediterranean lifestyle or mediterranean diet and we'll talk about that a little bit more but it did get the best overall diet for 2020 and uh it is uh, it's kind of stood the test of time because it is plant focused and it's sustainable and it's good for you know you think of climate and it's not a diet per se it's more of a lifestyle a food lifestyle yeah yeah so also in the 80s was the low fat high carb diet and food companies and manufacturers started to make or produce fat-free cookies fat-free chips snacks and uh, fat-free didn't mean calorie free so people started gaining weight and it's like you're eating these overly processed foods thinking that you can eat all you want because you're not eating fat but it didn't it wasn't great yeah yeah no kidding and then 1990s came the zone diet and they uh like their promotion was uh, add protein at every meal to reset metabolism and basically it was like 40 percent of the calories come from carbohydrates 30 percent of the calories come from protein and 30 percent of the calories come from fat so you're shifting away from the lower fat to more you know a little bit more fat like healthy fats and Jennifer Aniston was a big promoter of the zone diet. Right. I remember that too. Yeah. And then do you remember the blood type diet? Never heard of it. Really? Really. Okay. It was developed by a naturopath. And uh, basically the diet was based on individual blood type. Um, it's since been debunked. But the theme is there because uh, personalized nutrition based on Um, chemistry kind of is like a future trend like a customized nutrition is kind of the way of the future that sounds like something you'd have to pay a lot of money for (laughs) (laughs) totally does right you come in and we'll give you your special as soon as you say specialized just i just see dollar signs (laughs) that's so true eh? special lab and big fancy waiting room and yeah yeah Oh, the Subway diet was in the 90s. <laughs> Do you remember the Subway no. diet? <laughs> Who doesn't remember the Subway diet? That was just <laughs> such a joke. Well, I mean, it worked. It totally worked, right? Yeah, but it worked because he wasn't eating enough calories every day. Right. Yes. It seemed yeah. like, oh, you eat a sub, which is usually pretty filling, but it's not the only thing you eat throughout the course of the day. But if it is the only thing you eat through the course of the day, then you're starving yourself essentially, and of course you're going to lose weight. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It. Uh, yeah. He lost like 245 pounds in 11 months, and then he started to exercise too to help. Um, so yeah, definitely he he just basically cut out the other meals and ate subways. You and I should write a book called like the Cheese Diet, and and I'll eat nothing but cheese every day. <laughs> And then we'll, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm just joking. But, I mean, it's like you could do it with anything. You could say like the the beer diet or the whatever, but that's what makes me laugh is it's just like subs, really. Well, it reminds me of, um, I mean, the Super Size Me documentary about Mickey D's and yeah, yeah. eating that and how he basically always say yes to when they said, do you want to supersize it? And then his... Um, his lipids started going up and his his fats in his body he developed fatty liver and so it was a real good example of just 
eating highly processed foods every day. How what happens to your body? Yeah, the greasy, yeah. It's, it's a really good documentary. Um, I think it's still on Netflix, isn't it? Probably. Yeah, it's yeah. a really good documentary on. That was like in the 2000s, like before 2010. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see. In the 90s, the fiber started becoming more of a focus because vegetarians uh became more mainstream and there's like soy out there and veggie burgers so that kind of highlighted the uh, role of fiber in our diet right which still stands today as uh, really important for um to be you know satiated and getting feeling full uh when you eat and it's you know we know that fiber is good for a lot of things like your um your gi tract and the blood sugars and Helping with the reducing cholesterol levels, so it's and your bowels, right? That too, right? Yeah, when I said GI tract, I kind of meant oh, that. Okay, you're just being polite. <laughs> yeah. I just put it. I just I, I'm here to spell things out for people. So, <laughs> right. so the 2000s, uh, we saw a shift in eating to higher protein, lower carbs, and so the uh, food companies started to produce uh, low carb options. So the same kind of thing happened with the low fat where people started eating the low carb options and it's like highly processed, overly processed foods that they're eating. So the results aren't, you're not going to start losing weight just by eating low carb options. Right, right. And the Atkins, uh, which is very low carb, it took hold again. Uh, it's lean protein and fat and uh, healthy carbs. So the only thing it kind of lacks uh, calcium and vitamin D. Because they don't include dairy with it? I don't think so. Yeah. You know, there's some of those diets. Well, most diets usually have some sort of exclusion of, of some food group or some part of a food group. So whatever you're getting from those foods, yeah, you got to find those nutrients somewhere else. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's right. The South Beach diet came into that at that time too, and it had phases. So the strict phase and then the maintenance phase for it's supposed to be for life. So it was fairly good in terms of what was in the South Beach diet with good carbs, um, lean protein, low fat dairy, but lower carbs still and reducing the um, refined flour products and sugar. They're getting, if you put all of these together, you'd probably have a half decent diet because <laughs> all of them seem to have a pretty good idea, but they don't have the whole picture, you know, they're yeah. missing some parts or they've got some parts that are a little squirrely. Yeah. And, and you know, they put their own spin so they can yeah. market. I think that's the other thing. It's like, it's, okay, what hasn't been done yet? Oh, let's uh, let's try to sell this uh, concept. We'll write a book and sell a bunch of recipes and get a bunch of followers or however they're making money. And Yeah, it's, yeah. At Master Cleanse was um, the lemon juice, cayenne pepper, honey, and water. And it was kind of like the cabbage soup diet of the new millennial. And it's, uh, it's uh, Beyonce was touting that one. Yeah, it, I, I just like right away when, it, when, it, when there's some celebrity pushing it it's like okay no for me it's just like I, I don't want someone selling me food if you're trying to sell it to me then that to me is a red flag mm -hmm. yeah so yeah I agree yeah um, the raw food movement came uh, became more popular in the 2000s the late 2000s I think um, with uh, mostly with vegans and then the trans fats were demonized at that point too and that's it's bad trans fats <laughs> yeah well they aren't good <laughs> um and that's when the Super Size Me documentary, uh, like we mentioned that already. Right, right. And then uh, in the 2010s, like so since 2010, um, keto and paleo are kind of dominating uh, along with intermittent fasting and gluten-free. Oh, you can't forget gluten-free. That's the, I think that's taken hold. Uh, I, I think it's actually losing favor. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it, it was really popular and it's kind of, I think people are realizing that if they're eating like a lot of the overly processed rice products, um, they're not getting enough fiber and then it's like another, it's a diet basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, and you know, people that have celiac disease or celiac, um, they have gluten sensitivity, then definitely they need to be kind of more aware of where there is gluten in the food. Especially if you have celiac, you can't have gluten. But uh, 
I don't know other people I think it's it's becoming more like people are finding their diets are more liberalized with having some foods but whole grains like that might have gluten yeah like they they go all all in and then they kind of realize <clears throat> it's maybe not uh realistic and they sort of adapt to something that's a bit easier for them to manage yeah and i think a lot of people confuse gluten-free with carb free exactly so um yeah it's only one percent of the population that has celiac disease and so for them it's actually they need to do this it's like critically important that they don't have gluten right um but it's not a weight loss method it's a way of life that keeps their intestinal tract in check and they probably don't enjoy that it's not like something they would ever choose to do oh which gosh. is the irony you know yeah no and it's actually frustrating i've talked to many people with um, celiac that are frustrated because just having gluten-free options they're not maybe done as uh, meticulously as they should be done, like at a restaurant, for instance, or so they could have some, you know, uh, contamination, like cross-contamination happening. Yeah, for sure. Whereas uh, if you have celiac, you ha it has to be very um, strict. Yeah, very yeah. strict. And then um, paleo, that's, that's the, uh, I, I call that like the caveman diet, right? It's all about meat, eating meat like in just meat and only meat at every meal <laughs> that's funny the paleo diet um approximates what our uh, paleolithic ancestors ate oh right yeah because we should be like them so minimally processed whole foods plants and animals it generally excludes grains uh, dairy legumes starchy re root vegetables and processed foods hmm. so it is used for weight loss and glucose regulation and to reduce blood lipids and it does uh, actually lead to greater weight loss in the short term and the moderate paleo is safe but the extreme paleo that's that's where you have to like hunt and kill your <laughs> kill your food is that the extreme paleo Hide in, hide in the bush and wait for something to go by and you jump on it and drag it home to the homestead, to your cave. And... That's funny. Um, it is very, it is higher in protein for sure. It's actually double. So uh, it's a third of your calories are, come from protein, 2.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. So for you, Rob, we did this another time. And I think, what did we say for protein? Like 90 or 100 grams. There we go. Yeah. So on the paleo, you would need 210 grams. Yeah, there you go. So it's, uh, so the risk with it is increased risk of kidney stones and kidney dysfunction, um, insufficient calcium, vitamin D, iodine, actually. And it could lead to weight loss because the calories uh, are restricted and it's easier to feel full because it's nutrient dense foods. They're like highly satiating and it does have fiber and protein and fat and it excludes the um, sugar and refined carbohydrates. Right. But it is a difficult one for some people. Well, for many, most of the people to stay on long term. Yeah, especially if you live in the city. <clears throat> <laughs> so, <laughs> so funny. City. Well, you got to go to the country that you know, there's no wild animals roaming the city so it, it's a long way to drag it home you <laughs> crack me up <laughs> <laughs> all right so the baby food diet excuse me <laughs> even babies don't like baby food the baby food diet <laughs> yeah so it's conveniently portioned. <laughs> and it makes little it portions. Their ideal little glass snack jars. for people watching their calorie intake. What the hell? That's like the canned cat food diet. <laughs> oh, look, these nice little portions. This will be perfect. Let's sell this to people. Call it a diet. <laughs> that would make them lose weight for sure. Right? <laughs> oh, man. People are crazy. Sorry, I, sorry if you're on that diet, but that's just kind of wacky. Yeah, it was definitely not sustainable. It was like hard to go out for a meal at a restaurant. I guess so. Yeah. Do you have the children's menu? No, Do they you, needed jars of yeah, baby food. That's not Like pureed. And it's kind of interesting. I mean. Yeah. Anyway, um, I can see, yeah, that wouldn't be very sustainable. You wouldn't be uh, savoring your, your, your meals. 
Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I'd be throwing it on the floor <laughs> and screaming <laughs> and picking up my plate and throwing it at the wall. That's right. What is this crap? Well, the next step get up some, is get me some real food. Special K diet. <laughs> special K diet. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So you had cereal and milk twice a day. So it's like portion control and calorie control. And it was like the new version of the Subway diet. Let me guess. It was sponsored by Kellogg's. No, I don't know if... Uh... You can only eat Special K because there's oh, something... Oh, you know what it was? It was a Special K challenge. Oh, the challenge. So sponsored by Kellogg's. You replaced breakfast and lunch with Special K. Uh, cereal or bars. That must have been like right after the Subway diet. They're like, hey, we're onto something here. All these people are going to Subway because they think eating subs are going to lose weight. So we should do the same thing and make them all eat Special K. Well, they actually... We'll call the, it a challenge. The CEO in 2015 said it's basically asking people to deprive themselves. And they said, no, we don't want to promote this program. Good call. Holy... So it's, uh, yeah, can you imagine it going to a potluck and bringing your own <laughs> box? Okay, yeah, here, everyone. <laughs> I just don't even know what to say about that. There's so many things I could just. I'll bring the salad and I'll bring the appies and I'll bring the box of special cake. <laughs> it's that so is funny and so milk. wacky. So oh, wacky. interesting. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. And then, uh, let's see, there's also, um, oh, in well, food trucks came along in that, like, that's a huge um, driver of people's diets, I think, a lot of, uh, like, the mobile food trucks. Mm. And uh, milk replacements, we've talked about that on our first episode about um, plant-based milk alternatives. Yeah, yeah. And butter coffee, which uh, is butter part of coffee. the keto diet, the high-fat I heard people um, are putting mayonnaise in their coffee too. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. I know, yeah, I know, right? Interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, in 2020, the themes continue with uh, diets promoting weight loss, pre portioned food, meal replacements, uh, personalized approaches like custom eating um, and plant based diets and more sustainable diets. Yeah. it's It'll be interesting to see where it goes. It's always changing though. One thing I was going to sort of mention from what I've seen with people dieting, um, everyone kind of uh, gauges the, su the success of their diet on if they've lost weight. And I'm thinking, well, isn't there more to it than just weight loss? I mean, like, what about your overall health? Like, what's it doing? Like, like Buddy on the Subway diet there, yeah, he lost weight, but what happened to the rest of his body that, you know, like he's deprived of all the other nutrients for whatever amount of time he was on mm -hmm. or if you're eating a diet that you're not eating fiber or you're not eating i don't know what some some part of a food group dairy maybe what is that doing to the rest of your health if you're not getting those nutrients yeah yeah and there is more and more evidence showing that um like the for instance just talking about that like the keto or the paleo is is successful at people losing weight but it's now showing that it might be impacting heart health and their risk of developing uh, cardiovascular disease and other problems so it's it, like long-term yeah issues. So is weight loss always like the most important thing uh, not necessarily at all I yeah. mean you want to make sure that you're getting your nutrition and you're keeping your health uh, going and you know they've shown the evidence has shown that it's better to be overweight and fit versus like frail and thin so i mean it's it's better to be healthy if you can and try to eat you know eat a whole diet a whole uh, like minimally processed foods i like what michael P pollen says eat food not too much mostly plants yeah and that's pretty simple good advice yeah that's i think a, a really good thing to end on okay let's go eat Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully that was uh, uh, a bit um, informative for people. It's it's kind of like a look, uh, like a history lesson of kind of how, in some cases, how silly uh, diets are. And, and you can see that when you see them all at once, uh, like in this, what we've just been talking about. So 
Yeah, it really makes you think like, wow, what's, uh, I, you know, they're just fad diets, really. Yeah. A lot of these um, things that uh, people are uh, looking at and trying. And I remember something you've always told me, like, and I, I do this to this day still, if they're trying to sell something, if there's money attached to it or they're trying to sell something, then, you know. Be aware. Be aware, exactly. So just do do your homework and, and make sure that uh, you're making good food choices regarding diets. Sounds good. All right. Well, that's it for today. We will, uh, obviously, we'll be back again next week with something else. All uh, very exciting stuff. Happy Nutrition Month. Oh, right. Happy Nutrition Month. Let's go eat dinner. Yes. All right. Cheers. Thanks for joining us today on My Wife the Dietitian. If you like what you heard, don't be shy. Leave us a comment or review and be sure to share our podcast with your friends. If you'd like to hear more, hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us on our social media pages for updates, episode trailers, and other odds and ends. For more info and links on what we discussed on today's episode, check the show notes. We'll be back next week with another informative and fun-filled episode. Thank you.